Hideyuki Kikuchi takes us to a futuristic land where vampires coexist with humans in a dystopian, technologically advanced world. However, these vampires are also a lot different than the type of vampires we may be accustomed to. Yes, they do drink blood. No, they don't age. Yes, they hate the sunlight, and it seems like humans have forgotten that vampires are weak against garlic and crucifixes. But the vampires in Vampire Hunter D are not mere predators. They are the nobles who have recreated society in their own image and now rule over it. They are the nobles who have attained technological advancement like never before. They are the nobles who bow to their godly sacred ancestor every now and then. Are they the superior race? Seemingly so. Does that give them the right to enslave humans? Absolutely not. So why do they do it? Or rather, how did they achieve such a feat when there are so many humans and so few of them? Let's find out in today's video. Humanity's calculated fall and the rise of the nobility in a fantastically advanced medieval world. Vampire Hunter D is set in the distant future. Society had crumbled following a nuclear war in 1999 dubbed the Holocaust within the universe and it was subsequently overtaken by the elegant but dangerous nobles, or rather, vampires. Not so surprisingly, the nuclear war was triggered by the sacred ancestor of the vampires, who was based on the famous Count Dracula. The nobility had strategically and secretly confiscated every necessary resource that would allow humans to rebuild civilization. Its repercussions weakened humanity for the vampires to take over, who had also advanced science alongside the magic at their disposal. This allowed them to recreate the world in their image, allowing them to sit on top of the societal food chain with no one having the power or might to oppose them. They used their technology technology to genetically engineer the magical creatures on Earth, creating the likes of cyborg unicorns. These creatures were seemingly immortal, never aged, and possessed the ability to regenerate. This new world also began to witness the likes of demons, aliens, and extra-dimensional beings joining the ranks. As such, the world had become a place that was exponentially more different compared to what it used to be prior to the Holocaust. However, the nobility could not, or rather did not, want to create a space where humans did not exist at all, and the reason for it is a lot more twisted. With their unimaginable technology, these vampires could create food sources that would sustain them without them having to feed on human blood. However, they still continued to have a strong preference for hunting and consuming human blood and, as such, proceeded to coexist alongside humanity. However, all things must come to an end, and the nobility eventually reached the zenith of their existence. Their vampire technology was beyond perfect, with no room for improvement, which meant that there was no room for growth. So, it was finally time for them to fall from grace and for the humans to reclaim their spot at the top of the food chain. The nobility, who consider themselves to be a better species, was ready to do anything and everything to prevent their due. Humans began to fight back as vampire hunters began to rise. These hunters would fight vampires at the frontiers and protect people against their tyranny. But the situation wasn't as simple as your textbook humans versus vampires concept. The sacred ancestor had anticipated that one day the era of the nobility would cease to exist, and thus began the concept of humans procreating with vampires. Although not all the vampires were aware of the extent to which the program had been orchestrated. The titular protagonist, Vampire Hunter D, is one such hybrid, with his father being nobility and his mother being a human. Known as a Dampier, D despised his lineage and wished to be an ordinary human. He was ostracized by the nobility for not being pure-blooded and at the same time ostracized by humans for being part vampire. This meant that he was all alone in his immortal body. The only thing he could do was hunt down those cruel vampires vampires. His being a Dampier also made him far more powerful than the average human vampire hunter. The combination of the dwindling numbers of the nobility and the rise of the vampire hunters opened the gates for human society to fall into order once again. The premise of Vampire Hunter D took inspiration from several genres of cinema, such as science fiction, western, dark fantasy horror, occult science, and even folklore. For example, the nobility's technological advancements and the rise of the mutants as a result of the nuclear war can be categorized under the sci-fi genre. The battle between the nobility and the independent four higher vampires at the frontiers resembles the western genre set in the wild wild west. The blood-sucking immortal vampires kill two birds with one stone as they can be categorized as folklore as well as dark fantasy horror. All in all, writer Hideyuki Kikuchi has successfully crafted the perfect premise for a fantastic show by creating an amalgamation of some of his most loved genres. The Society of the Nobility How a world run by bloodthirsty vampires differs from that of humans. The life cycle of the average human is to be born, grow up, get fragile, and pass away. A human doesn't have to be killed for them to die. 
With age, the human organs begin to deteriorate. In fact, these begin to happen quite early in their lives. At the age of 15, a human teen can happily munch on their favorite fast food without falling ill unless they go overboard. At the age of 30, regular consumption of oily french fries isn't going to fare well with the human digestive system. The metabolism slows down dramatically. One becomes more prone to having weaker bones. As the years pass by, humans grow older and older. Skin wrinkles and the body loses its strength, eyesight gets weaker, and so does hearing. Ultimately, when the organs cannot persevere any longer, the human perishes without being killed. That's not how it works for vampires. The nobility can, much like humans, reproduce sexually. They are also capable of possessing emotions like humans themselves. They procreate and raise their children. These children go from being babies who cannot fend for themselves to capable adult vampires that one must feel threatened by. However, after a certain point, aging comes to a standstill. The internal, as well as the superficial body, never fall victim to the likes of organ failure. Although older vampires do exist, much like Count Magnus Lee from the 1985 Vampire Hunter D movie, there is a good chance that the Count himself is hundreds, if not thousands, of years old. D, the Dampier, is seemingly 10,000 years old and has not shown a single sign of physical deterioration. Men and women alike have fawned over him and his flawless visuals for millennia. The only way a noble can perish is by being killed. Immortality in this case does not necessarily mean someone who can never die, but rather someone who can never die due to natural causes. Considering how powerful vampires and Dampiers are, killing them is far from being a piece of cake especially for humans, although it's not impossible. We skimmed over the rise of the nobility on Earth not too long ago, but to understand their society better, we really need to get into the details of it. It all began long before the advent of recorded human history. Following humanity's rise, the vampires, ruled by the sacred ancestor, concealed the knowledge of their associations. These vampires were also ruled by a body and it was based in the Crystal Palace. Hoping to take over one day, the vampires pre-planned the fall of humanity. They would eventually seize the opportunity to take over the world and create the New World Order, with vampires ruling as the nobles. And thus came the Nuclear Holocaust, a day of despair for human history and the very day the vampires took the first step towards their throne. But that was not a chain reaction of events as you might expect. For a thousand years following the Holocaust, the vampires did not interfere. They took their sweet time observing a world that had to recreate itself from scratch. And yet, humans failed to return to their glory even by the year 3000 AD. Things were a lot worse than than they used to be immediately after the nuclear war. Man had regressed to a state of savagery, much like his prehistoric ancestors. This created the perfect opening for the vampires who seemingly took control of the chaos in the world and became its rulers. This is why the term vampire and nobility are interchangeable within the context of Vampire Hunter D. Humans fell under the vampires, who considered themselves to be the greater species. Considering their biological nature and technological advancement, there was much truth to this sentiment. And this was also one of the key factors in the nobility getting to rule with little to no opposition for a thousand years. In these thousand years, the nobility reached the peak of science. While humans had tried their hands and succeeded at various categories of scientific discovery, it was nothing compared to what the nobility had achieved. What previously happened only in science fiction movies was now a reality. The nobility had figured out how to use technology to control weather, how to manipulate space and time, and how to travel across space. Mystical creatures previously present in fantasy genres became a part of the ecosystem, and they were genetically engineered cyborgs as well. Defensive and offensive weapon systems were unparalleled. Cybernetic and artificial intelligence was commonplace, and genetically engineered creations and animals were all over the world. In Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust, we are introduced to a spaceship-like structure which Carmilla had promised to allow Meyer Link and Charlotte to use. Because Meyer Link was a vampire and Charlotte was human, their love would never be accepted in their respective societies, even if she was turned into a vampire. However, to be with one another, they decided to fly away to the City of the Night, which was only possible if they used a spaceship. Carmilla even explained how most ancient castles possessed such spaceships, and that they were frequently used when the reign of the nobles was at its peak. This acts as a another signifier of just how advanced the vampire society was. There was also the rise of the mutants, which took place as a repercussion of the nuclear war and its toxic fallout. The radiation pollution mutated normal humans and animals, giving them unique appearances and powers. We get to see one such mutant in the 1985 film when D has been rendered comatose by Count Magnus Lee's children and he is on the verge of being consumed by a mutant. Regan Say appears as a mutant with the ability to alter space. D also falls into the clutches of other mutant beings when he goes to the Crystal Palace. We get to see more of these mutants in the sequel, Bloodlust, as we are introduced to the Barbaroi, who protect Meyer Link. This brings us to the likes of the Shadow 
manipulating Benji, the shape-shifting Caroline, and the werewolf Mashira. In this reign of the vampires, each noble had control over a particular area of the frontier. These areas, referred to as sectors, had to be protected by their assigned noble. At the same time, a noble could not attempt to annex another noble's sector. The Central Frontier Sector, located in the capital city, formed the central government of this society of vampires and acted as a regulatory body for their entire species as well as a checks and balances system. Each sector overlord had to offer blood tithes to the center in order to keep and maintain their marginal rights over their respective sectors. Despite the differences compared to human society, the nobility followed a hierarchical structure much like humans did. The lower nobles worshipped the 1,000 greater nobles and the seven kings, and every noble, including the higher ones, considered the sacred ancestor to be at the peak of the system. Within this structure, pure-blooded vampires were held in high esteem. This meant that a vampire was born of intercourse between its vampire mother and vampire father. Humans who had been turned into vampires were not considered to be pure bloods since it did not signify prestigious familial lineage, which was necessary for gaining power within the society of the nobles. More often than not, transformed vampires were often used as servants by the pure bloods. Dampiers were held in much lower regard due to being humans and also because their existence signified intercourse between a noble and a lower species or humans. Interestingly, D is far from being a stereotypical dampier, although he is looked down upon by human and vampire society alike. He was genetically engineered by the sacred ancestor who used his own DNA with that of female humans as an experiment. Although the society of the nobility was fairly democratic, there was and could be no one above the sacred ancestor himself. He was deemed to be the vampire king as well as the high chancellor of their ministry. In a way, he was like a god to the other vampires. However, the sacred ancestor seemingly disappeared after he anticipated the fall of the nobles. He passed the baton to the ultimate mind, which is an advisory system, which continued to act as the guide that delivered the ancestors' laws. However, the ministry began to tamper with the ultimate mind to gain more power over the nobility. Their plotting and scheming came to an end when they were all executed, resulting in the dissolution of the ministry. This created the House of Peers system, where the capital was constantly at war against any nobles who rebelled. By 4000 AD, the nobility had begun to decline rapidly, more so due to their own faults than human resistance. Their immortality had also been one of the key players in causing their demise as a society. The numbers went down from hundreds and thousands to a mere fraction of what they used to be. Their super science wasn't super enough for them to maintain their stronghold because their enemies at this point were vampires themselves. Remember what Zemo said in MCU's Captain America Civil War? An empire toppled by its enemies could rise again, but one which crumbles from within? That's dead forever. The way the vampires had taken advantage of the collapse of human society came back to haunt them when humans did the same to them. Call it karma or the circle of life or even justice, but mankind eventually took over the vampire capital and either killed or drove out the nobles. With the rise of vampire hunters, they could now fight their enslavers. But more so than that, humans had the numbers. In the year 12,090 AD, we see the small number of nobles reduced to a handful, with the remaining vampires living at the frontiers. Unfortunately for them, the vampire hunters who fight at the frontiers are there to make their time on Earth even shorter. How did the vampires come to be and why did they enslave humanity? As the god ancestor to the tyrannical nobles, the sacred ancestor is considered to be the main antagonist in Vampire Hunter D. He is the progenitor of the nobility, which has apparently been a thing even before Earth's creation. He can be a symbol of cruelty and at the same time, he can be a savior. In both cases, he is enigmatic and beyond the scope and reach of every single character within the novels. The sacred ancestor took great interest in his mysterious scientific experiments and he was very dedicated to creating the perfect being. He achieved some of that with the vampires themselves and more of that with D, who had the strength of the vampire without the weaknesses since he was a dampier. Despite being a ruthless scientist who would go to extreme lengths to acquire both humans and vampires alike for his specimens, he has occasionally saved isolated human towns, although he may have done so to keep humans available for his experimentations. D has professed a strong hatred for not just his own father but also the entire vampire race. Considering D is not cruel by any means, this means that there has to be some reason why D has such a strong hatred for his father figure. We do know that D despises his mixed lineage and was strongly against the union of Meyer Link and Charlotte in Bloodlust because he didn't want more Dampiers to be born. That could be a reason behind D's hatred of the Sacred Ancestor since he brought him into this cruel world. But the Sacred Ancestor seems to have brought not just D but every other vampire into existence as well. These beings got their strengths and weaknesses from 
Dracula himself. It is possible his obsession with experimentation resulted in the creation of the new race on Earth, with the ancestor being the very first of his kind. This new race possessed powers that varied from vampire to vampire. However, certain abilities were commonly present in all. They could regenerate and recuperate from wounds unless they had been decapitated or a stake had been driven into their heart. They all possessed super strength, speed, sight, and agility. They also possessed sharp senses and could gain control over their victims from quite a distance. However, vampires were prone to bloodlust, which the sacred ancestor considered to be their biggest flaw. He wished to create a vampire who didn't possess the traditional weaknesses, such as the need to drink blood or an aversion to the sun. This is where D comes in. The usage of human DNA alongside that of the sacred ancestors was done to create a perfect being with the strength of a vampire without any of its weaknesses. As we see in Bloodlust, D can gain control over his own bloodlust and operate under the sun for a substantial period of time, after which he either needs to stay away from the light or stay buried underground to regain his strength. All in all, D is considered to be one of the strongest beings in the universe of Vampire Hunter D, second to only the sacred ancestor himself. D was also enhanced with a sentient symbiote on his left hand, who would occasionally save D from being killed. However, we don't know how or why D became one with the left hand homunculus. Considering the might of the vampires over that of humans, the sacred ancestor wished for its kind to rule as the superior species. However, he knew better than partaking in abrupt conquests which would only create more tension and opposition from humanity itself. As such, he had to bide his time, throw the world into chaos and savagery, and swoop in at the right time to ensure a reign of vampires with little to no opposition. Vampire Hunter D and its disposition of tropes and cliches. The story of Vampire Hunter D breaks several tropes that are popularly seen in media that revolve around vampires. It is the first of its kind to portray the race of vampires as technologically superior beings. The blend of sci-fi and dystopia with medieval European folklore may be jarring, but it also brings something new to the mix. Instead of living in the past, the future, or sticking to the present, the story of Vampire Hunter D creates a present that blends the past with the future. We cannot talk about a story of vampires without bringing in romance. Tales of Dracula have often depicted enticing scenes between vampires and women, where a steamy neck kiss turns into a bloody scene, since the neck is the spot that vampires prey on when they crave human blood. And of course, everyone is aware of stories such as Twilight and the Vampire Diaries, which are dominantly romantic and with love triangles galore. Although these instances have become iconic in their own right, overexposure to the same tropes tends to make them stale. Because Vampire Hunter D is Japanese media, unlike the other two, most people are likely to gain exposure to it after already knowing about Twilight and Vampire Diaries. Fortunately, Vampire Hunter D dabbles in tropes of romance without diving too deep into them. We see girls falling in love with D left, right, and center, and rightfully so, but D never becomes a part of a romance or a love triangle. Another trope that Vampire Hunter D breaks is with respect to its female characters. A common problem with these characters has been the fact that they are grouped into extreme categories. She's either a helpless damsel who cannot do anything without a man's help, or she's a fatalistic, strong, and independent woman who is the epitome of badassery and doesn't need a man's help. Both tropes have gained popularity and eventually lost it due to their unrealistic nature. Viewers love emotional relatability, even when the premise of a show is rooted in fantasy. The average human being, irrespective of their gender, has a mixed array of emotions. No one is the complete personification of helplessness or independence, because humans are multi-layered and multi-dimensional. Unfortunately, vampire-focused media has always portrayed femme fatales or damsels in distress. Vampire Hunter D strays away from both tropes. Let's pick some key female characters. Doris from the 1985 film and Layla and Charlotte from Bloodlust. Every single character has a realistic emotional range. Doris makes her introduction is a spunky and feisty girl who is brave and wants to take down vampires. She's strong for a human as well, but she is well aware of her limits and knows that there are certain things that D is better equipped to handle because of his unreal abilities. Despite being strong, she isn't incapable of falling in love, and even though she does fall in love, she knows when to let go. Out of the three characters mentioned here, Doris, however, is the least impressive. Next, we have Charlotte, who at face value seems to be a highborn girl abducted by a noble. However, we find out that it was her personal choice 
since her and Meyer Link were in love with each other. A character is not good when they are helpless or badass, but when they have agency. In the case of Charlotte, it was her personal choice to be with Meyer Link and be turned into a vampire. As such, the audience and the characters alike can empathize with her character. And finally, we have Layla, who is quite possibly the best character in the movie franchise. And this is because we see her strength, her weaknesses, her emotions of anger, vengeance, sorrow, and rebellion all within a single movie. She is the epitome of a multi-dimensional character. She hunts down vampires because her mother was killed by one. She is put on the case to bring Charlotte back or kill her before she turns into a vampire. And yet, we see her confused when she sees that Meyer Link and Charlotte genuinely care for one another. So much so that after Carmilla kills Charlotte, Layla allows for Meyer Link's departure to the City of the Night with Charlotte's body because this is the least she could do after witnessing their tragedy. She also develops a good friendship with Dee, which is solidified by him keeping an old promise of bringing a flower to her funeral when she is old and dead. The greatest thing about Vampire Hunter D is how the focus is more so on the story and less on the interesting premise. Many a story has fallen prey to being underdeveloped while having great world building. Sometimes with a premise that is impeccable, it becomes harder to make a story that matches up to it. However, Vampire Hunter D places its importance on the story and emotions without allowing the futuristic medieval premise to overpower it. As such, Vampire Hunter D succeeds at breaking tropes that have been done and dusted across vampire movies and stories, and thus makes a separate place for itself in the hearts of the viewers and the readers. Marvelous Verdict It's hard to rule that the nobles are cruel beings because they're not a monolith. They have their individual identities and possess an emotional range far beyond wanting to consume human blood. We get to see this with the likes of Meyer Link and even the sacred ancestor bearing disgust towards Carmilla because of her unbelievable bloodlust. They love, they care, they fear, they threaten, and they hate, much like humans themselves. And that is what makes the world of Vampire Hunter D so nuanced and enticing. With that, today's video comes to an end. What did you think of Vampire Hunter D and the Nobles? Did you enjoy this video? And did you want us to continue covering Vampire Hunter D? If so, don't forget to like and comment on this video down below. Until next time, thanks for watching, stay safe out there, and have a marvelous day.